Hello everyone, my name is Clay Butts. I'm an instructor up here in Memphis, Tennessee with NIMSA. And we're going to examine Module 9 today, Chapters 32 through 36, focusing on trauma. Starting out, Chapter 32, looking at spinal injury and spinal motion restriction. Important chapter that we will look at now. So some of the things that we need to be cognizant about as we go through is knowing our anatomy. We're going to look at the spinal cord versus what the spinal column is. Talk about the different regions of the spine, the functional divisions of the nervous system, and the three main tracks of nerve signals as they travel. So here we have an example of the spinal column versus the spinal cord. The spinal column is the actual spine. These are vertebral discs, the column, the bony structures that encapsulate the spinal cord. The spinal cord is the bundle of nerves that exits the cranial vault, creating the spinal cord. Um, outside of that, anything that exists outside of the spinal column is going to be peripheral nerves. These are motor nerves. Um, these are sensory nerves. Uh, anything that runs down to your fingers, to your toes, these would be part of the peripheral nervous system, whereas the brain and the spinal cord are your central nervous system. So as we look at regions of the spine, this is our spinal column made up of these vertebral discs. We're going to start with the most superior region, the cervical spine. We call these C1 through C7. This part of the spine is the most mobile part of the spine. We can turn our heads left to right. We can lift our heads top and bottom. And we can even rotate around our shoulders at the cervical spine. Where this allows us great freedom and mobility to move and track things with our eyes and our head, it also allows a lot less protection in this part of the spine as compared to others. Um, also, because it's as uh, high up in the spinal cord, any injuries sustained in the cervical spine typically have more effect than, we'll say, a lumbar injury or so on. The next set of uh, vertebrae we're covering are going to be the thoracic spine, also known as T1 through T12. Um, these uh, vertebra have ribs that come off that fuse in the front to the sternum. They protect your thoracic cavity. The next portion of the spine we're looking at is the lumbar region. That would be L1 through L5. Some cars, some chairs have lumbar support. It's a good way to remember this, your lower back. And then finally, the sacral region of your spine is made up of two different bones. We have the sacral bone or the sacrum. And then lastly, your tailbone, also known as your coccyx. The functional divisions of our nervous system are made up basically of two things, the voluntary system and the autonomic system. Now the voluntary system obviously controls your skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle being that muscle we can control in our arms, our legs, our body. It allows us to move and function in the world around us. Whereas the autonomic nervous system is the involuntary side. Things like breathing, um, digesting food, that kind of thing. We don't have to think about, it just happens. Now within this autonomic system are really two responses. We have a sympathetic response and a parasympathetic response. Let's talk about the sympathetic first. You might have heard this called the fight or flight response. This is essentially caused by adrenaline being pumped into our vessels. Um, that is epinephrine, adrenaline, same thing. When we have this response, it's a result of fear or uh, stress. It leads to vasoconstriction, meaning our vessels get um, tighter. That's going to increase um, blood pressure. 
It's also going to increase our heart rate and it dumps some uh, chemicals that allow us to tap into ener energy reserves we have in our body. The parasympathetic response is the exact opposite. Okay, we call this the feed and breed response. And what this means is now we're in a relaxed state, a restful state. Our vessels, rather than being uh, constricted, begin to dilate, they relax, and they allow more blood flow through the body. This also allows um, more energy to be spent on digestion rather than fleeing from a perceived threat. There are three tracks of the spinal cord, the motor tract, the pain tract, and the light touch tract. Basically what these do is coordinate movement, the perception of pain, or the perception of light touch to and from whatever the stimulus is. Meaning if I wanted to move the right arm of my body, that signal is sent along the right side of the spinal cord. If I smash my left toe with a hammer, that signal is actually sent up the opposite side, so the right side of my spinal cord. Whereas if someone touched me on the left shoulder, that signal is sent up the same side, so the left side of the spinal cord. This is important when we start discussing incomplete spinal cord injuries in just a moment. When we talk about an incomplete spinal cord injury, this what we're meaning essentially is the, the spinal cord is not completely transected. If we had a complete spinal cord injury, let's say, where the entire spinal cord at one point is injured, anything below that injury, we would not be able to feel light touch, sense pain, or send any movement. This is complete paralysis, we would say. But if we have an incomplete spinal cord injury, essentially that means that some of the tissue of the spinal cord at the site of an injury can still carry or receive messages. These three syndromes are incomplete spinal cord injuries and manifest with differing signs and symptoms. For instance, the central cord syndrome we have the injury exists in the center of the spinal cord, whereas the peripheral part of the spinal cord can still carry and receive messages. What's strange about a central cord syndrome is that these patients may be able to walk towards you, but could not necessarily move their upper extremities. So maybe someone could walk but not be able to shake your hand, they might be suffering from central cord syndrome. In anterior cord syndrome, we have a nearly complete spinal cord injury. However, the posterior of the spinal cord is uninjured. This portion of the spine actually carries light touch sensations. So, if someone will say at T1 is injured and suffers from anterior cord syndrome, they would not be able to move anything from T1 down. However, they might still be able to feel sensation of their toes, knees, legs, anything below T1. Now the brown succord syndrome, we have one side of the spinal cord that is injured but the other is not. This would mean that the left side of the spinal cord, if it's injured, would mean that the left side of the body could not move, but the right side of the body could. The left side of the body could not receive light touch, but the right side of the body could. However, the right side of the body could not experience pain, whereas the left side of the body could, because the pain signals are sent on the unaffected side. Very strange symptoms.
Again, these are examples of an incomplete spinal cord injury. Now, aside from paralysis or our incomplete spinal cord injuries, we could also suffer something called spinal shock. This is typically a temporary form of shock. We would list it as a distributive class shock. And basically what happens is as that spinal cord is injured, we lose the ability to send that sympathetic signal uh, back and forth to the brain, which basically puts us in a parasympathetic state, meaning our vessels are going to vasodilate. Well, if we vasodilate all our vessels, it basically means there's a lot of blood traveling through to the extremities of uh, all of our vasculature, and this we could call neurogenic hypotension. It means our blood pressure is going to drop like a rock, and the cause of it is neurogenic, meaning it's it's starting, it's happening in the nerves in the brain. Um, what's interesting about spinal shock is a lot of times these patients won't present with any tachycardia or tachypnea because again, there's no stimulation of that. There's no sympathetic response. We're going to treat it as all shock would be treated, protect from heat loss, transport, and obviously with anything in our uh, chapter 32 spinal motion restriction chapter. We want to prevent future harm by limiting that movement, possibly seat collar and protect it. So when we look at chapter 32, the common treatments and skills that we will learn would be the spine board using a vest type extrication device, whether you call it a clamshell, whether you call it a KED, basically the same thing. Remember, we need to know how to do the jaw thrust maneuver on any patients that we have spinal motion restriction on. And then there's some special circumstances we need to cover, such as kids in car seats, and particularly in this chapter, we'll deal with helmets. When we talk about kids in car seats, if they have been in a car accident that's significant and we need to use spinal motion restriction on these patients, what we don't do is leave them in the car seat and then place the car seat into our ambulance on a stretcher or in, in one of those seats. The idea behind this is that that car seat, having been involved in a high energy impact, is compromised and may no longer provide safety for that patient. We'd remove them from the car seat and then place them in spinal motion restriction as you see appropriate. The other thing we need to speak on would be helmets. As a rule, we're always going to remove a helmet if we can't assess breathing and airway status. So whether this is a motorcycle helmet or this is a football helmet, we need to remove that helmet if it interferes with airway management. If it doesn't fit well, it probably needs to be removed. Overall, if it interferes with spinal motion restriction, and if the patient is in cardiac arrest, obviously these helmets need to be removed. Now the exception to these rules would be a, a football player who has a helmet on, we'll say a face mask, a face cage over it, and they're wearing shoulder pads. If we're able to see that their airway is managed, that their breathing is appropriate, what we could do is simply remove the face cage over that using um, a drill or shears to remove that and we could leave the helmet and the head the shoulder pads in place to have spinal alignment we'd secure the helmet to the patient and transport to the hospital in chapter 33 we're going to examine the eye face and neck injuries that are common in our patients so first some anatomy of the eye we have several different portions here, um, things that we need to know. Uh, the rear of the eye is called the retina. This lens helps focus images. The pupil is the dark spot in the center of our eye, whereas the iris is the colored portion of our eye. And then covering both of that is what we call the cornea. As we deal with our face, it's 
it's a good idea to remind ourselves of the anatomy of the skull. The things that we're going to talk about specifically would be the mandible, which would be the jaw, the maxilla, which would be the upper bone attached to our teeth, part of our cheekbones is called our zygomatic bone, and then our orbit would basically be our eye socket. We also have a nasal bone. The frontal bone is part of the skull, but sometimes it comes down um, and will interfere with eye injuries. And when we talk about a neck injury, because there's so much going through the neck between vasculature like your jugular and your carotid, um, it has airway complications with our trachea. You could injure vertebra um, depending upon the mechanism of injury. And then any nerves in and out of the neck uh, always have complications when we have neck injuries. These are very difficult to manage and we need to be very cautious as we, as we do. When dealing with eye injuries, these can be very traumatic. Um, after clearing ABCs and presuming with the rest of our assessment, we need to examine how much damage has been done to, uh, to the eyes. We do this through visual inspection, pupillary response. Do we see discoloration, drainage, bleeding, swelling, deformity to the eye or to the eye sockets? When we can, we can check fields of vision to see if, um, if their vision is affected. If we note something like double vision or diplopia, this is a key finding in an injury called orbital fractures. Whereas if we find photophobia, a sensitivity to the light, the light hurts their eyes significantly. Although this can be tied to several medical issues, in trauma this is mostly associated with corneal damage. Chemical burns happen frequently with, uh, with eye injuries and need irrigation from either saline or plain tap water um, liberally for over 20 minutes just flush, 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 try to get that contaminant out. As we're doing that, we need to make sure if it's a one eye that needs irrigation, that we don't flush any of the contaminants into the unaffected eye. As far as contacts go, um, we can leave those in except when we have chemical burns or um, unresponsive patients that have hard contacts. We can try to remove those with either suction devices uh, or little, little cups. We use cups to immobilize any impalements to the eye. Uh, this is important because our eyes track together. When we, when we immobilize an impalement or we dress any eye injury, we, we typically cover both eyes. And this is important because our eyes track together. And when we remove someone's sense of sight, we need to stay with them. We don't leave them uh, unattended. When dealing with injuries to the face and neck, assessing kind of from the eyes down, nasal fractures can be very painful, um, but our largest concern is airway involvement. So consider suction early and positioning so that any fluids or debris will drain out of the nasal canal. We don't want to pack the nose with anything. Um, we can use cold compresses where appropriate and avoid NPAs in known or suspected nasal fractures because this can and will make the injury uh, more significant. In dealing with dental emergencies, if we have a vole's teeth, we rinse those with saline, holding them not by the root, um, but by the uh, tip of the teeth. And really considering dentures, Unless they're broken or loose or obviously an airway issue, we can leave dentures in. But on any patient where we are concerned that dentures could have airway involvement, best practice is to go ahead and remove it. Ear trauma, very straightforward management. As long as we don't pack anything in the ears um, or apply too much pressure, it's simple bandaging um, to, to reduce pain and to stop bleeding on, on ears. In neck, um, obviously because of the cervical involvement, we consider SMR2 any um, suspected neck injury 
and penetrating trauma should be addressed with gloved hands similar to what we'll talk about soon in, in sucking chest wounds um, and then using occlusive bandaging beyond the edge of the wounds to prevent air from coming into the, uh, the neck cavity and some of the vessels. All right, some good final key concepts. For all patients, we always want to try to prevent further harm as early as possible. Um, so neck injuries, if we suspect that because of their cervical spine involvement, we always want to consider SMR. Um, be early to consider suctioning as needed to any facial trauma. Occlusive dressing should be bandaged on any neck wound that's, uh, that's penetrating. And then be careful how or the practice for irrigating eyes so that we don't, again, contaminate another unaffected eye. We never leave patients unattended once we have bandaged both their eyes together very important key concepts here closing out chapter 33. In chapter 34 we're learning about chest trauma. We'll learn specifics um, in injury patterns and common presentations but first we need to involve some anatomy. Speaking on the anatomy of the chest we have ribs and the sternum they really help protect the thoracic cavity the muscular system, the diaphragm, uh, the large muscle at the inferior aspect of the thoracic cavity, and then intercostal muscles, accessory muscles, all help us ventilate and keep the system working the way it's, it's supposed to. Other aspects of the thoracic cavity include the respiratory system, made up here of the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, the alveoli, and the lung tissue itself. Surrounding each lung is a covering known as a pleura. We have both the visceral and the parietal pleura, which we'll get into momentarily. You also have the cardiovascular system at work, the heart, the great vessels. There's also a pericardial sac, which similar to the pleura, is a membrane covering the exterior of the heart. You'll also see this term called mediastinum. The mediastinum is essentially the center directly beneath the sternal plate that consists of the great vessels, again, the aorta, the vena cava, the esophagus, the trachea, and the heart itself all exist in what's known as the mediastinum. Another quick reminder, as we breathe in and out, we call that action ventilation. Now the two phases of ventilation are inhalation and exhalation. Inhalation, remember, is caused by negative pressure. Our diaphragm flexes, it causes negative pressure inside the thoracic cavity and air is physically sucked into the lungs. Exhalation is just the opposite. The diaphragm relaxes causing an increase in intrathoracic pressure and air escapes out of the trachea. Between the two, exhalation is the more passive phase, meaning it doesn't or shouldn't take much energy to exhale, where in inhalation, it uses energy because the diaphragm has to flex. Now this whole system is a closed system. There's one way in, there's one way out, there shouldn't be any deviation from that. So if there's a leak somewhere in that closed system, we've got a problem and that problem can be compounded the longer it goes on. The two types of general chest injuries that we're gonna talk about are open chest injuries and closed chest injuries. Very simple to remember that if it's an open chest injury, it means there's a hole there's an insult, there's damage physically, typically penetrating to the chest. Our main concern with open chest injuries are sucking chest wounds. We always presume that an open chest injury is going to cause a pneumothorax. This pneumothorax, when unchecked, can, will progress into a tension pneumothorax, which is a true life-threatening issue.
We'll talk about how to address that in a few slides. Now a closed chest injury, typically caused by blunt force trauma. There is not a penetration so that the outside of the chest is intact, but this can cause hidden damage. So you can have bruising, contusions, fractures, all this while the exterior of the chest is still relatively intact. A flail chest segment is an excellent example of a closed chest injury that can still be life-threatening. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some specific chest injuries. The first one we're gonna discuss is called a pneumothorax. Pneumo kind of means air, thorax means the thoracic cavity. What this basically means is that there's air in the chest outside of where it should be. In this case, air is trapped between the pleural space and as it grows in volume, it takes up volume that would otherwise be used for respiration inside the lungs. The two main types of a pneumothorax is an open pneumothorax or a closed one, right? So an open pneumothorax is going to be caused by a sucking chest wound, whereas a closed pneumothorax, which we'll get into in a moment, means that the visceral pleura, which covers the organs, has a hole and it's leaking into a closed or intact parietal pleura. Now, a simple pneumothorax is typically how most pneumothoraxes start. It can be spontaneous, but in this chapter, we're talking more about trauma-induced. So again, it could be caused by an open pneumothorax where air is entering from the outside of the body, or it can be enclosed where air is leaking from the inside of the lungs in between the chest wall. Either way, a simple pneumothorax, if left untreated, can or may or will lead to a tension pneumothorax. So a tension pneumothorax essentially just means now that this pneumothorax has gotten large enough that pressure is keeping the heart and the lungs from expanding appropriately. And we're going to start to see functionality differences in blood pressure, in tidal volume, um, cardiac output, all of it. Again, this is a true life threat. A lot of times pneumothoraxes can be hard to visualize, and I think this diagram does a good job of explaining both. If we look to the outside, here we have, let's say it's a stab, let's say it's a penetrating trauma. It really doesn't matter for this purpose. This would be considered a sucking chest wound. When we inhale, we're drawing air not only through our trachea, but also through this open hole in our chest. That air is going to fill up in between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. This would be an example of an open pneumothorax. A closed pneumothorax is when we have here, if this is intact now, so we don't have um, a penetrating trauma here, but instead the visceral pleura has a hole in it. So when as I breathe in, air not only goes in here and here, but it also escapes out of this hole in the visceral pleura and fills up the space in the same way. In this slide, these diagrams kind of go over this again. In the closed pneumothorax, we have damage to the visceral pleura, whereas our parietal pleura is intact. Air is accumulating in between the two. In the open pneumothorax, we have no problem with our visceral pleura, but because of this damage here, air is entering and not really wanting to escape in our open pneumothorax. The treatment for this is to cover this area to prevent air from getting in. We do this with occlusive dressings, which we'll talk about in a few slides again. So now that we've seen the anatomy and understand a little bit about how it works,
we ask what signs and symptoms would we see of a pneumothorax? Well, obviously shortness of breath is going to be huge, but if we hear decreased breath sounds on one side, particularly the side if there's an insult to it, that's a high degree of suspicion for a pneumothorax. If when we expose the chest, if we see a penetration, whether it's bubbling, whether it's frothing or not, we assume they could have a pneumothorax. Um, a late sign would be tracheal deviation, meaning that the trachea, rather than being midline, would be pushed over to one side or the other. Remember that tracheal deviation is always going to point away from the injured lung. Again, late signs would be JVD or jugular vein distension, and the patient overall may experience shock-like symptoms. The two treatments that we have for pneumothoraxes depend upon whether it's an open or a closed pneumothorax. For the open pneumothorax or the sucking chest wound, an EMT can be a lifesaver in this instance. Immediately after finding these sucking chest wounds, we place a gloved hand over the injury to prevent air from getting in further. And when we can, we need to immediately replace our hand with an occlusive dressing to prevent air from getting in again. In the closed pneumothorax, remember that the chest wall won't be penetrated, but the air is escaping through the visceral pleura. In this case, there's very little that an EMT can do in their skill set. So rapid transport and an ALS intercept is key in these patients. Where paramedics do have a little bit more um, SOPs and standing orders to, to treat this, ultimately definitive care may be best achieved with rapid transport to a trauma facility. The next injury we're going to speak to is something known as a flail chest. Now, a flail chest is typically brought about by blunt force trauma, and it means two or more ribs are broken in two or more places. I have a diagram in the following slides that's going to help break that down. But ultimately, we can determine that a flail chest is in play when we have paradoxical chest wall movement. What this means is that as we breathe in, our chest moves in the opposite direction as it normally would. The same happens when we exhale. So normally when we breathe in, our chest rises, but the flail segment would be sucked in. When exhaling, our chest normally falls down, but in a flail section, it would be pushed out. How do we treat this? Well, over the years, we've, we've had a bunch of different modalities for treating it. Today, the, the most common and the most treatable way we can, we can manage this would be in bag valve masks and maybe using CPAP essentially to add pressure inside the lungs to splint, not from the outside, but from the inside. What we have found over the years is that by trying to splint the outside of the chest wall, it really doesn't work and limits patients by making their breaths shallower and less effective. Here, we can see our two or more ribs are broken in two or more places, meaning this section would be our flail section. This would be where we would note flail chest movement, that paradoxical chest wall movement. Now this is the anterior portion of the chest. When we look at the other slide, we see the same thing now on the posterior section. So remember that this is an injury that is not just limited to the front or the anterior portion, but could also happen on the lateral or the posterior side of a chest. A pulmonary contusion essentially is just bruising of the lung tissue. And this can happen from blunt force or penetrating trauma. Um, it can cause dyspnea or shortness of breath, 
We might see cyanosis, particularly of the chest wall, and bruising. Our treatment, very similar to a closed pneumothorax, would be ventilatory support with a bag mask and or CPAP per protocol. A hemothorax, very similar in pathophysiology to a pneumothorax, with the key difference being hemo. Hema meaning blood, so there is blood filling up in between the pleural linings, the visceral and the parietal. You could also have blood and air, which would be a hemopneumothorax. Both of these can be life-threatening because not only do we have issues of air pressure causing um, interthoracic pressure changes, but also a loss of blood. Our treatment is going to be the same. Any external chest wound we can find, use an occlusive dressing, keep them warm, keep them oxygenated, treat them for shock, and rapid transport to our trauma destinations. Here's your example of a hemopneumothorax or a hemothorax. We have bleeding from somewhere inside the lungs where blood now is filling up and pressing on a lung. Traumatic asphyxia is caused when our chest is compressed very suddenly for a short amount of time. We have a compression injury that is forcing blood to move against its normal path. It's going to cause ruptured blood vessels above the chest. So when we see bloodshot eyes, we might even see ruptures in the face and the neck and the shoulders. It'll turn purple. It'll look bruised. Um, the treatment for this, same as anything else, we treat them for shock, address any open chest wounds with occlusive dressings, and then rapid transport. Cardiac contusions are when the heart muscle itself is bruised, and it's typically brought about by blunt force trauma. So a baseball bat to the chest. Maybe that compression injury we just spoke on could cause a cardiac contusion. The patient will complain of chest pain. You may hear or see crepitus, um, signs of shock with tachycardia, or irregular heartbeats are a key indication of cardiac contusion. These can develop into sudden cardiac arrest. So really for treatment, again, we treat them as anything else, but be vigilant in anyone who has had a, uh, a blunt force trauma injury to the chest because cardiac arrest can follow very quickly. So be ready to perform CPR and to place an AED as necessary. Pericardial tamponade or cardiac tamponade essentially is when fluid is building up in the pericardial sac surrounding the heart. This most commonly occurs as a result of penetrating chest trauma. As that fluid builds, that pericardial sac does not stretch very well, and so as blood and fluid starts to swell around the heart, it compresses the heart so the heart can't expand inside that sac. The signs and symptoms of this are narrowing pulse pressures, pulse pressure being the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. You may see jugular vein distension, a term called pulsus paradoxus, which is when the radial pulse and on palpation weakens when the patient breathes in, and again, other shock-like symptoms. Treatment for this, treat for shock, rapid transport, very similar to everything else we've covered. This would be the example here. This membrane around the heart is the pericardial sac, and as blood starts to accumulate, it compresses all around the heart to keep it from expanding as well. So obviously that's going to decrease cardiac output and cause obstructive shock. In chapter 35, we're gonna be discussing abdominal and genitourinary trauma and how it affects our systems as well. The anatomy of our abdominal cavity uh, is numerous. 
starting out with the diaphragm at the superior aspect of our abdominal cavity. Remember our diaphragm is that muscle that separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal wall. We also have solid organs, hollow organs, something called the peritoneum, which is again that lining that covers both organs and the entire cavity itself. The visceral peritoneum is the lining that covers the individual organs, whereas the parietal peritoneum covers the, the wall of the abdomen. You also have something called the retroperitoneal cavity, which resides in the posterior, kind of behind the abdominal cavity. And this is mostly where your kidneys hang out. Other structures inside of our abdominal cavity might be the aorta, the vena cava, arteries, veins, numerous in, in number. When we talk about some of the organs in our abdom, uh, abdominal area, we have hollow organs, which although aren't as vascular, meaning they don't have as much blood, um, they can spill contents when ruptured. So something like our stomach, if we have a ruptured stomach or a ruptured bladder, that's going to leak the contents, either stomach acid or urine, into the peritoneal cavity, cause um, inflammation, infection. Pain can be delayed in this uh, because it's not as, a, as an acute of an injury, but these can be just as life-threatening, if not more so. Solid organs, very vascular, and um, they can be sheared, they can be torn, they can be punctured and bleed significantly. Um, shock through blood loss is very common, even with minimal signs and symptoms, because of their position in the body and uh, how difficult they are to determine um, if they're hemorrhaging or not. Examples here, liver, spleen, our kidneys, all examples of solid organs. So how do we assess for this? Well, remember that we divide our abdomen into quadrants, so we draw a midline from our sternum down and then right around our belly button. We would draw another imaginary line across and we have now four quadrants. The upper right, the upper left, the lower right, and the lower left quadrant. Really, you need to learn and memorize which quadrants are associated with which organs. Um, Across the board, though, when we're assessing a non-injured abdomen, the patient should have soft, non-tender issue upon palpation, meaning when I push on any part of the quadrants, there, there should not be any pain, discomfort, or guarding. Um, those are absolutely abnormal findings. If it feels rigid when we push um, and this patient has a, a very firm, very rigid aspect that isn't present in all four, that is a key sign that they're injured. Another good um, sign of injury would be the, the way the patient is presenting. So if they're curled up in the fetal position, most of the time that indicates a possible abdominal injury. The treatments for abdominal injuries are pretty standard. Um, we want to typically transport them in a position of comfort, like that fetal position. Um, specific to our abdomen, because we don't have bones encapsulating the abdomen, they're more prone to what's known as evisceration. Visceration meaning the organs are protruding from the abdominal cavity to the outside. Now, what we need to do in treatment of this is saturate bulky dressings in sterile water cover the, the evisceration, and then place an occlusive material over top of it. We want to make sure that that bulky dressing is not dry because that can dry out the organs that are protruding, causing ischemia, necrosis, and they'd have to be excised upon a surgical consult. Um, also, huge rule here, we don't push or pull anything protruding from the abdominal wall or really any evisceration. We're never going to remove things or trim or cut or push anything back in. Now, all abdominal injuries, we should anticipate shock and treat them as such.
We transport these patients with expediency because again, um, they might be in shock and we just have a hard time seeing it because it takes a while for distension or bruising or obvious signs of bleeding to present. In chapter 36, we're going to cover multi-system trauma and some trauma of special populations. Multi-system trauma is essentially a trauma that's going to affect multiple systems, right? So why is that bad? Well, it increases mortality significantly when instead of just having a simple leg fracture, if we have a femur fracture that is, um, has nicked an artery, and now we have cardiovascular, muscular, skeletal trauma. Um, most of the time we see this correlated to mechanism of injury. The higher the exchange of energy in the patient, the more likely we see uh, an increase in mortality, meaning death. So the key to multi-system trauma management is time management. We talk about the platinum 10 minutes, meaning as soon as we get there, we have 10 minutes to do our assessment, load and begin transporting to a destination guideline. Overall, you'll hear the term golden hour, which basically means we have the highest chance of survival if we can get that patient to a trauma destination from the start of their injury to that trauma OR within an hour. Now, destination guidelines vary from state to state, but ultimately they outline which facilities are most appropriate for those trauma patients. So you don't wanna take somebody with a sprained ankle to a level one trauma center, whereas if someone has been uh, rolled over by a uh, a semi, um, those are patients that are going to have multi-system trauma, and we need to take those to the highest level care, like your level one trauma centers. It's easy to have tunnel vision. You see these um, gross and debilitating injuries, and we focus on treating it right there. Remember, treat those life threats, then assess for secondary injuries on the way to those destinations. Some other key terms in trauma, when we have pregnant patients, remember what your gestation guidelines are and know that fetal survivability is directly tied to if the mom survives. Position your pregnant patients on their left or raise their right hip slightly to avoid supine hypotensive syndrome. In cases of trauma in the second and third trimester, consider abrupto placenta, uh, particularly if we see vaginal bleeding resulting from those trauma. In the pediatrics, red flags in indicating abuse are going to be examples of um, bruising um, to the trunk without any kind of extremity trauma. Wound patterns not matching the mechanism of injury in your eyes. Um, sometimes delaying care if a provider, um, if, a, if a family is anxious or is trying to hide injuries and so they haven't had their, their kid taken to the appropriate facility in hours or days, all red flags to us that we need to uh, report up the chain in that regard. Remember to utilize the pediatric assessment triangle to um, assess the most life-threatening injuries or life-threatening conditions to those patients. Um, shock is very difficult to detect in pediatrics, particularly by vitals alone. Rely more upon your um, capillary refill than blood pressure in determining volume status in patients and rapid transport any child with a uh, deficient side of that pediatric assessment triangle. Do not delay in treating these patients.
In the geriatric patient, they're more susceptible to trauma based upon their advanced age and decreased mobility. They also could have multiple um, medical issues, which can compound trauma significantly. Osteoporosis will increase fractures because they've lost bone density among the elderly. So something that might just be a slip and fall for an average adult might break a hip or dislocate a knee much more commonly in the elderly. Medications may also worsen trauma outcomes, particularly the example would be a blood thinner. Um, this is gonna cause them to bleed more profusely without clotting off and can increase death as, uh, as it occurs. The other issues that we have in geriatrics would be cognitive impairment, which uh, don't allow us to get good history or maybe even understand where or how the patient is hurting.